Isn't it fantastic when you can sing that song and mean it? <laughs> Man. Well, I'll be straight up. It is well with my soul this morning. I've been in this chapter of Scripture all week, and I'm super excited to share it with you. You guys excited to hear God's Word? Yes. All right. Well, uh, we are in Philippians chapter 3. I took the liberty of putting the passage of Scripture in your sermon notes for you, so if you don't have a Bible, you can turn there, or if you're more comfortable reading it there, we can do that. Uh, this, this passage of Scripture has been churning in my heart for a while. The Bible says the lines have fallen in good places, and when I found that this was the passage of Scripture I got to preach on, I've been excited all week, and I'm excited to be able to share this with you guys this morning. Uh, Lord put something on my heart in this passage of Scripture, and I want to be able to share that with you. Before we get into the Word, uh, I'm going to take you back. We're going to do a little road trip back to 1994. Uh, I was not yet a Christian, and I worked in downtown Chicago at a golf course. And uh, from 1994 to 2003, they built a par 3 course in downtown, downtown Chicago. If you guys know where the S-curve is on Lakeshore Drive, right next to the Swiss Hotel, they built a par 3 course and a driving range. And that was a job I had. And uh, it was kind of neat. There would be celebrities would come in because all the rich people stay in those $300 a night hotels downtown. And they would see the golf course and they kind of wander over. And uh, I kind of took their money. I set them up with the greens fees and everything. And uh, there were two guys that stuck out of my mind that would come because they would come every single day. They were two police officers of the uh, Chicago Police Force. And if you guys ever seen like the movie The Fugitive and they show the, what the Chicago policemen look like, uh, that's kind of what these guys look like. They've been on the force for 35 years. They were just kind of ticking off the days till their retirement kicked in. And they were just kind of killing time at the golf course every day. I'd hook them up with sodas. I'd let them hit some balls. We became good friends. They were older than me. And uh, they were the epitome of a Chicago cop. And uh, I thought they liked me. I kind of liked them, and it was whatever. And one day, towards the end of the summer of 94, one of the cops pulled into, uh, like I said, their full gear, and he pulled out his wallet, and he pulled out a business card, and he gave it to me. And he said, this is for you. And this is the business card he gave me. And he said, uh, he said, Wayne, in Chicago, this is kind of not very well known, but we have uh, these business cards we give out to friends, close friends, and relatives, and uh, here's the deal, Wayne. If you get pulled over for a minor violation, not you can't kill anybody or anything, but a minor violation, uh, you know, a traffic stop, speeding or something, you hand this to the police officer, the police officer's going to know you're part of the Chicago pr police fraternity, and you get off. I was like, sweet. I, I wasn't a hugger yet, so I shook their hands and said, thanks, man. And uh, I put it in my wallet. And I carried this card... Uh, this card for a year until I got saved. And I'm telling you, I lived free, I lived easy. Chicago was a fantastic place to live in the summer, hence fall of 94, because I had a get out of jail free card that these cops had given me. So I perfected, you guys know what a Chicago stop is at a stop sign? I perfected that. They're gonna rename that the Wayne stop. And I just kind of would cruise in, no one's coming, so just kind of lay off the gas, slow down, and then pick it back up again. No full stop for me because I'm covered, I'm clean, I'm, I, I'm good. So fast forward, it's September of 95, I get saved and I'm going to a church uh, in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, and one of the guys there was a police officer, and I'm like, hey, check out what I got. And he starts laughing at me in church. I'm like, what's so funny? He's like, that's a joke. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, that's not real. The cops just made that up, and they're just giving them to people to mess with them. I'm like, whoa! My face goes ashen white. <laughs> For over a year, I held on to that thing, thinking I'm going to get out of any traffic violation or speeding ticket because I got this thing in my back pocket. Well, these officers duped it on me. Officer Callahan and Murphy got one over on me, and no one knew, I knew in my heart, but I never talked to anybody about it, probably till today that I had that for a year, and I had this uh, confidence that I was good to go. And uh, taking it full circle to Christians, with a group this size, there's some of you that have this in your back pocket saying, I got the get out of hell free card. I prayed the prayer back in 94, 02, 2013, 91, 
I've prayed it sometimes, and I'm good to go. And my life hasn't changed. The Holy Spirit hasn't done anything in me. I'm the, still the same person, but I got this card. I signed it at a church. I walked an aisle. I prayed a prayer. Maybe, but maybe, just maybe, you've been duped into thinking you can get out of hell for free because you prayed a prayer once. I'm concerned for you. And this passage of Scripture we're going to look at today is going to show us what a true Christian looks like. Uh, Brennan preached last week at the end of this passage, Paul's heart cry in 10 and 11 were, I want to know Christ. At the end of the day, I just want to know Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul had one thing on his mind. I want to know Christ. And uh, I enter church world, and I've been in a lot of churches since that one, Elk Grove Baptist Church I got saved in, and I've noticed two people groups in every church setting I've been at, including Racine Bible Church. I've seen uh, two people groups. So I want to ask you a question today. The title of the message is Holy Dissatisfaction. Are you sitting here today saying, man, I love Jesus. I want to know him more and I'm dissatisfied because my sin is still there. I don't know him as I ought. I make stupid choices sometimes. I'm not really satisfied. I haven't arrived. That'd be like Paul's heart. And there's other people of you and I've met some of you. It's like, I'm good. I'm good. I've kind of, I've arrived and this is kind of my club and uh, that's what I'm crying out for today. We have two people groups, and they're kind of noticed in uh, both the Gospels. In Luke chapter 18, uh, these are kind of like satisfied people. 18, 9 through 14, it says this. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. The end game for being satisfied, acting like you've arrived in church world, is you look down on people, and you become a Pharisee in your heart and you judge and are critical of people. Jesus told those people this story. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, <laughs> I thank you that I'm not like these other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I've got. Basically saying, I've arrived. I've made it. I'm in. I'm in the club. I got the, I got the card. It goes on, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast. and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I thought about that Pharisee in the story. Maybe he started out as the tax collector, beating his breast, saying, I got nothing. Have mercy on me. But over time, he became a Pharisee. I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. How do you know if you're humbled or not? You love other people. I've heard it said, good doctrine without love. It's not good doctrine. It just isn't. Second group of people, and I've met most of you, and praise the Lord, most, most everybody I've met here is in this second camp, Matthew chapter 5. These are what I would call the dissatisfied people. They're not satisfied with their life with Jesus. They want more. And these kind of church folks... Uh, Jesus said in his first sermon, in 5.3, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. They admit they're needy, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, you know, mourn over their sin, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. I want more Jesus. I want to get rid of my sin nature. I want to know more of him. They would say with Paul, I want to know Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. They're not putting a veneer over their heart. They're like, this is who I really am. I'm desperate for Jesus, and I'm unashamed to let people know. They're pure in heart, and God says they will see God. So I ask you today, even before we get into God's word, do you have a holy dissatisfaction? Are you not content with where you're at and you want to press on and know Jesus more? Philippians chapter 3 is going to have some uh, elixirs for us. When I first became saved, there were some people at that church who said, whoa, 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 Wayne, Wayne. You're kind of on fire now, but give it a little time. This is going to fade, and you're going to kind of become, you know, it's going to kind of become a little more standard. And I didn't say it to him, but I looked at him. I'm like, I don't want to become like you. I want to become like the Apostle Paul. I want to run this race. And as I studied this passage, I didn't know this. Paul wrote this. He had been saved for 30 years. 
He wasn't a new convert saying, I want to know Christ. He was 30 years into his walk with Jesus. 30 years. 30 years ago was 1985. You know how long ago that was? That's the last time the Bears won the Super Bowl. It's a really long time. Some of you are like, I wasn't even born yet. That's how long Paul had been walking with Jesus when he wrote Philippians chapter 3. And Paul knew he had been changed when God knocked him off that horse in Acts chapter 9. He knew he had been changed uh, positionally. He was clean before God. But he knew conditionally he had some work to do and he had a long way to go. And when we get saved, it's not the end, it's the start of the race. If you're not saved yet, you're not in the race yet. But once you get saved, that's the starting point, not the finish point. The finish point is the day we meet him. The starting point is bowing your knee and saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus saves you. Well, God has saved Paul. 30 years later, he writes, I want to know Christ. He had this holy dissatisfaction. And I think if you want to be a great scientist in this world, study the work of Einstein. And you'll be like, man, i got a long way to go. I can't really grasp all his concepts. If you want to be a great artist, study Picasso or Rembrandt, and you'll be like, man, i got such a long way to go to be a great artist. If you want to be a great musician, study Youthy. And <laughs> Sarah Youthy. <laughs> and you realize you still have a long way to go in the realm of music. And brothers and sisters, if you want to be a great Christian, don't compare yourself to each other. Compare yourself to Jesus, and you'll realize, huh, I have a long way to go, and God will make you into a Matthew 5 Christian who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, who longs to know Jesus more, who will be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I, I want to know Christ. That's going to be my life goal. I just want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so, somehow, to attain to the resurrection from the dead. And that's where we pick this up, our passage today. But before I do it, will you guys pray with me? Father, you've lit me up in this passage. This is phenomenal. This is so exciting, this passage of Scripture. But Lord, it's just uh, ink on paper. Lord, you need to enliven it. We desperately want to have the written word expose us to the living word, Jesus Christ. So... Holy Spirit, I pray that you would blow fresh upon this room. I pray, Lord, that the next 25 or 30 minutes would be profitable to our souls. So maybe we came in here today and we couldn't say it as well with my soul. But Lord, when we walk out of here at 1210 or 1215, or if we stay and encourage each other 1230, we'd be able to say, <laughs> it is well with my soul. We need help, Lord. I pray that you would speak. And uh, Lord, you would uh, encourage and convict us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what I'd like to do is read the passage of Scripture together, and then we'll kind of look at it. Starting in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we've already obtained. Attained. Well, you guys ready? Anybody here still? All right, Philippians chapter 3. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. Paul was writing to uh, these false teachers that were in Philippi saying, oh, you can become perfect. Don't worry about it. You can attain perfection before going to heaven. And Paul was writing, man, I haven't become perfect. And I haven't really run into anybody claiming those claims today, but I've run into guys that love Joel Osteen or love the health and wealth gospel. There's fights still to be had, just as Paul had in those days. And he says, man, I haven't obtained all this. or I'm not perfect yet, but I press on. And what I see there in the words press on, it's like give maximum effort. I'm leaning into Jesus. I'm striving forward. It's going to be my life's focus to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And uh, I don't think Paul would have had a bumper sticker on his chariot that said, let go, let God. I think his bumper sticker would have said, pursue Christ. I think that's what he would have had to say as he says here in this verse. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. 
Paul remembers 30 years prior when Jesus apprehended him like a cat would grab a kitten by the scruff of the neck and say, you're coming with me, Paul. And uh, what I'd like to just note there, A.W. Tozer said it best, God is always prior. So if you're a Christian here today, it's because God chose you to be saved and then you received him by faith. Paul got knocked off his horse. Uh, Lydia had her heart open to believe, also in Acts. The Bible says Jesus is our good shepherd. He goes after the sheep. Jesus said these words, you did not choose me. I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that'll last. Jesus also said, no one comes to the Father unless the Father draws him. He also said, or it says in Ephesians chapter 1, he chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So God chose me, and he chose me and got a hold of me back in 1995. Can you remember the day when it all made sense and it wasn't just religious jargon, but it was actually about a person, Jesus Christ? I do, and Paul does. He says, 30 years later, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took, took hold of me. In verse 13, it continues. It says, brothers, term of endearment, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. But one thing I do, and uh, we'll take a little aside there. When I thought about that one thing I do, uh, many of you know I was the brewer's chaplain for, uh, I don't know, 12 years or so. From 2001 to 2012, I was a brewer's chaplain. And one thing, one of the coaches, his name was Billy Castro. He was a bullpen coach, so he taught the pitchers how to pitch. He was a pitcher from 1974 to 1980, and then he, for 17 years, he was one of the coaches of the Brewers. And uh, he, we became friends, not a Christian, still not a Christian as far as I know, but he said these words to me, and I thought they were really interesting. Uh, we were watching a couple pitchers, uh, Ben Sheets, like was one of the best pitchers the Brewers had, and another guy pitch. I'm like, man, these guys are fantastic. And he said, you know what? The best baseball players I've ever seen never made it to the big leagues. I'm like, what? Better than Sheets? This is like in 05 or whatever. He's like, yeah, the best baseball players I've ever met never made it to the big leagues. I'm like, why? And uh, he quoted scripture to me, even though he didn't know he was quoting. He said they were double-minded. They had different interests. He said all these guys would go off. They got into the women. They got into the drugs. They got into the alcohol. They got into the, uh, the exciting lifestyle, and they forgot their focus, and they got off. I didn't realize how much effort these ballplayers put in to being the best they can be in the world of baseball. Uh, when I started in 2001, this is a true story, I thought for a one o'clock game, the guys showed up like at noon. You know, maybe brushed their teeth, put their sunflower seeds in their pocket and got on the uniform and went out. And uh, it was like, holy cow, for a seven o'clock game, they get there at two in the afternoon. For a, a one o'clock Sunday matinee game, they get there at nine in the morning. Why? They're just practicing, 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 looking at film, looking at tape, studying, looking at scouting reports. All they do is concentrate on one thing. The hitters making sure they know that pitcher they're facing and the pitching staff that might come after them. And the hitters, uh, I mean, and the pitchers studying the lineup of all the hitters' tendencies. They studied one thing. And uh, I thought about this. I thought about one, one of the players that I got to know fairly well uh, was a man named Prince Fielder. He was the first baseman for a number of years. And as God sovereignly allowed it, he would come to chapels, and I began a relationship with him. And we go out maybe once a year uh, to a restaurant, and I would talk to him. And I remember talking to him one time. I said, Prince, uh, how come you think you're so good? And I thought there'd be something like, God gave me this gift. <laughs> that wasn't the answer. He said, I have a passion to be the best player in baseball. I'm like, oh, yeah, the best player on the team this year? He's like, no, 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 the best player in baseball that's ever lived. I'm like, what are you talking about? Babe Ruth, Mickey Mantle, Pete Rose. He's like, no, 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 I want to be better than all of them. And I watched from a distance, but I watched all the time he put in. He was concerned about just like three things, hitting, fielding, and throwing. That's all he would focus on. It was just baseball, baseball, baseball. When the other players would travel, he'd have his family come with him so he wouldn't be tempted to go out and do all the other things. He doesn't really do many uh, advertising things because it takes a lot of effort and time. And He was focused on one thing. And if you can be focused on something as foolish as baseball, to be the best in that, brothers and sisters, can't we be the best and say, I'm about one thing. Prince was about baseball. I'm going to be about Jesus Christ. I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul. I want to know Christ. That's going to be my one thing, and I'm going to filter everything else through that one ultimate goal. Prince's ultimate goal, be the best player baseball's ever seen. My ultimate goal, 
love Jesus more than I've ever loved anything else in the world and get to know him better. I want to know Christ. Is that your heart today? It was Paul's heart 2,000 years ago, and he says, Brothers, verse 13, I do not consider myself yet to take and hold of it. One thing I do. He says something interesting. He says, forgetting what is behind. How do we make this one thing happen? Paul says it like this. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. We forget the past. We press on, strain in the, in the present, towards the future. Uh, but I want to focus on one little passage here in verse 13. Forgetting what is behind. So Paul, why would you say that? And then I remember Jesus said that. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 9? No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for this kingdom, for service in the kingdom of God. So God doesn't want us to be looking back in the past. And I started thinking about Paul's life. What would you do if you looked in the past? And I thought Paul's saying here, forgetting what is behind. Brothers, sisters, Paul's saying, forget the good and forget the bad from the past and press forward today in 2015. So if Paul would have focused on like the good, what could he have focused on in this past? Well, he was the greatest missionary to ever live. He was this great evangelist, led tons of people to Jesus. He was the founding pastor of countless churches in the known world at that time. Uh, he suffered more for the gospel than anyone else. Paul, you even told kings about Jesus. You rose up to the highest of the level to witness to them. And then we have in Philippians chapter 3, he was circumcised on the eighth day, He's the people of Israel. He's the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisee, for zeal, persecuting the church, legalistic righteousness. He was faultless. Man, if you ever want to remember some stuff, Paul, you should remember your past. Your past is good. And I think about uh, why Paul is saying, man, I forget what is behind. What happens when we remember all the good things that we've done in the past? Pride. And pride will kill us. So Paul says, I forget all that good stuff in the past. And today, maybe you're here. I've talked to people when I'm witnessing, oh, I was an altar boy. I'm like, really? That's what you're going to hang your hat on? You're, you lit some candles and put them out at the end of a service? That's your thing? You know, but in the evangelical world, I've uh, talked to some people. Oh, I led this guy to Christ back in 09. I'm like, that was 09. It's been six years. What have you done for me lately? Are you still pursuing Jesus? Or are we going to live in the glory of 09? Other people, oh, I went on this mission trip. It was fantastic. I did this, this, and this. Like, well, okay, if that's what your thing is. But at the end of the day, if we remember and bring up our past a lot, that's good. Pride. And you're like, well, Paul, how about can we, re can we keep remembering our past, the bad stuff? And I think Paul would say, forget what is behind the bad stuff. Paul, you killed Christians. Paul, you hated Jesus. Paul, those verses 5 and 6 made you one of the most self-righteous people this world's ever seen. You thought you had it all going on because of your past. And uh, I think Paul would say, yeah, I did kill Christians. Yeah, I was self-righteous. Yeah, I hated Jesus. And it produced guilt in me. But praise the Lord, Jesus forgave me. And if you're here today and you're saying, Wayne, I've been through a divorce. I can't get over it. I keep looking back to how horrible that was. Maybe you're here today. I got an abortion a few years back and that is just troubling me. I can't get it out of my sight. Maybe you're like, I was a bad son. I was a bad daughter. My parents are gone now. I can't make it up to them. Paul would say these words, forget what is behind and press on to what is ahead. So if you're struggling with guilt here today, take it to Jesus. Next time the enemy comes at you and says, you did this, you did that horrible sin, praise the Lord, he forgave me of that. That's why we have a cross. That's why we worship Jesus who died in our place. We're not here to be self-righteous. We're here to be those who have been forgiven by Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I forget what is behind, the good stuff and the bad stuff. That's in the rearview mirror. I'm pressing on. I'm straining towards what is ahead. And then he continues in verse 14. He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize. Uh, now, if you see in the bottom of your bulletin, I put in Proverbs 4, 25 through 27. If you turn there, we're going to look at these three verses quickly. How they relate to verse 14. Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize. I thought about this when I thought about verse 14. I thought about Proverbs 4, 25 through 27. Listen to these words. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Focus on eternity. Focus on where you're heading. Here's our verse, verse 26. Ponder the path of your feet. Ponder the path of your feet. 
then all your ways will be sure. So when, as I ponder the path of my feet, the pondering I do is, will this, lead me, will this path lead me to the goal of knowing Christ better? Or will this path not take me to my ultimate goal, which is to know Christ better? I want to filter everything through. I want to know Christ. Will this path, is the path I'm on today, is that leading me to where I want to go? God says, ponder the path. Not just your steps. We all take missteps. But ponder the path, your way of life. Ponder your path to your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. No matter what happens, you know you're following Jesus in the right way. Verse 27, do not swerve. Whoa, that looks nice. I think I'll do this for six months or a year. No, 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 no. Don't swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. As I thought about that, I thought about a very famous book, probably the most famous Christian book ever written, Pilgrim's Progress. And I thought about uh, the characters uh, in this book. It was written by John Bunyan in 1678 in relation to pondering the paths that you take. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress is what's called a Christian allegory. It's just about the Christian life. And the main character's name was Graceless. And then God saves him and he starts on a path and God renames him Christian. And he has a friend named Hopeful that walks along the path with him on the way to the celestial city, which is called heaven. And this is where we pick it up in the middle of this walk they have as they're pressing on toward the goal to know Christ. The author writes, Now I behold in my dream that the pilgrims were discouraged and their feet ached from walking on the rough path. The Christian life had got hard for them. Then Christians saw a soft meadow running parallel alongside the way. So not total opposite, just kind of parallel. There was a little soft meadow running alongside. Christian persuaded Hopeful that the bypath looked easier and much pleasanter to travel. So the two men climbed off the path and discovered that the meadow was indeed much more comfortable underfoot. Man, this is much smoother than following Jesus wholeheartedly. They also saw a man ahead of them called Vain Confidence on his way, as he said to the celestial city, this finally convinced them that their path was safe. However, before long, it grew dark and Christian and Hopeful suddenly lost ki- sight of conf- vain confidence. When they called out to him, they heard no reply but only a distant groan for he had fallen down in a deep pit dug by the owner of this meadow and was dashed to pieces with his fall. Then it began to rain heavily as storms in life come along. Thunder and lightning broke out and the water level rose rapidly. Who would have thought this path could lead us so far out of the way, cried Christian in despair. I was wary of it from the beginning, but I didn't like to give you a stronger caution because you're older than I. Christian pleaded for forgiveness for leading his brother astray and Hopeful gave it readily, believing it would turn out for their own good in the end. They could not manage to get back to the path that night, but found a small shelter and rested there until dawn. They tried to keep watch, but were so exhausted they eventually nodded off. Not far from that place loomed an ominous-looking fortress called Doubting Castle. The property, along with that meadow, belong to giant despair. And as the story goes along, we'll stop there. Uh, Christian and Hopeful were in a bad place for a very long time because they took what the author John Bunyan calls the bypath meadow. And brothers and sisters, verse 26 of Proverbs 4 says, ponder the path of your feet. If I can just plead with you, when you see other routes to go, don't look at it for the meadow. Look at it, that it's a bypath. So often we see the meadow and we go towards it because it's easier way. Realize that it's a bypath taking you not towards your desired goal of following Christ wholeheartedly. You say, well, Wayne, that's great. You know, Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago. It's probably easier to follow the path to follow Jesus back then. Uh, John Bunyan wrote it 400 years ago. Times have changed, you know. What does it look like today in 2015? Well, I'm, that's a great question. I have four real-life examples of following Christ, counting the cost, and choosing the path God has for us uh, in relation to verse 14 of pressing toward the goal. Pressing. It's going to cost you something, brothers and sisters. If you want to be serious about following Jesus Christ, this will cost you. Uh, Well, let me just share with you. Uh, Back in 2002, uh, my son Caleb was two years old. And we had a little baby boy named Sam. And uh, I was involved in a church softball league. I played for another church at the time. I was their first baseman. And uh, that was on Thursday nights, pardon me. On Thursday nights, I played church softball. And Tuesday nights, we had started a men's Bible study two years prior, this men's Tuesday night Bible study. 
And my wife, being the good wife she is, saying, hey, we got two little kids at home. You're not gallivanting out every night. You need to be home to help. So she said these words, one of the two has to go. So by God's grace, I got rid of softball. And uh, I wasn't going to become Prince Fielder, so it wasn't that big of a give up. And I know in my Christianese, I could have kind of wrestled through, oh, you know, I'm going to witness to guys on the team, and it's, it's going to be fellowship. And No, when I play sports, I'm extremely competitive. <laughs> There's no Christian virtue in me. I'm very driven to win, and it's a, it's a fault of mine, actually. But why did I choose the men's Bible study, which has probably blessed over 1,000 men in these 15 years? Why did I choose that over playing softball? One reason. I want to know Christ. I wasn't going to know Christ playing softball. I was going to know Christ gathering with 15 or 20 men at that time and growing my relationship with Jesus Christ. I wanted to press on toward the goal to win the prize. A couple of years elapse. Uh, now we have Caleb, Sam, and Christian in 2005, in 2007, and in 2013. I had the exact same thing happen. All three of my boys played Little League so baseball. So we got them in this little peewee league, this, that. Well, my boys are pretty good. Uh, Caleb was like the star player when he was eight or whatever. And uh, I remember it was like we, every three boy, all three boys made it to the championship game of whatever that is. And then the coaches come up, it's Saturday. Oh, we won, we're going to the championship game. The game's tomorrow at 11. Everybody be here at 10. So Carol and I look at each other, and I'm like, all right, I'll handle this. So go up to the coach. All three coaches, all three different men, none of them Christians. Hey, coach, we're not going to be able to make the game on Sunday. What? One of the three actually cursed at me. <laughs> He's like, are you out of your mind? It's the championship game. I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I guess you're going to be without your number four hitter for the game. I, we're not going to be able to make it. Why? I'm a Christian, and I go to church on Sundays. It's probably the most important part of my week idiot. <laughs> just kind of walks away. So you just kind of have to take that. As a Christian, you have to take that. I chose to not play baseball on Sunday for my children. Why? One reason. I want my kids to know Christ. That's it. I just want my kids to know Christ. I want my family to know Christ. Two other quick stories, both from our church. Uh, three years ago, my wife was uh, working in the youth group here at church, and she had a girl she was super excited about spiritually, her name was Krista Burse. Her family comes here. Krista's off at Madison right now. Krista was the best tennis player for Case High School. And she actually had scholarship offers to the D2 teams, her mom told me later. But she was kind of drifting away from Jesus, and she made a choice, and she quit tennis her senior year. No one does that. Who does that? You quit your senior year at Case High School because she wanted to come to youth group on Wednesday night and she wanted to come to church on Sunday, and there was practices both those days, and it was squeezing her, and she made a choice. And she said, no, I want to follow Christ, and it's going to cost her, and it did cost her. It cost her a college, college scholarship, and it cost her her senior year of tennis. Is there anything wrong with playing tennis? Absolutely nothing. But sometimes we get squeezed, and sometimes we have bypath meadows saying, this way might be okay, this way might be okay, and it might be okay, but it might not. You have to ask the Lord as you ponder your path, is this path going to take me to the goal of winning Jesus Christ? Is this going to take me where I want to go? And finally, the last one, this is the most recent one. A year and a half ago, a friend of ours uh, comes to this church, uh, is a salesman, got a job promotion. Uh, more money, more power, more prestige. All he had to do was move to Iowa. And uh, they said, you're going to have this whole territory in Iowa. You're going to make a lot more money. It's going to be great. And uh, this brother of ours comes to this church, prayed about it, and uh, he turned it down. He turned down going to Iowa for that good job promotion to stay. And I said, why are you doing that, bro? He said, because my family's growing it. We've seen Bible church. Why did he do it? I want my family to know Christ. That's his goal. He wants his family to know Jesus. And it cost him a job promotion. A uh, little update on that. Just this, uh, like two months ago, we had our last baptism and one of his kids was baptized in the water. Now, would that girl have been baptized in Iowa? Maybe. Maybe not. He chose to stay on the path. And uh, just last week, our elders decided to call him to be an elder at this church. Doesn't that excite you to have a man like that overseeing your souls here at church? I say all that to say this. It's going to cost you if you really want to follow Jesus. And if you have this holy dissatisfaction rising in you. I don't like the path I'm on. It's the lukewarm path. I'm tired of that. I want to follow Christ. Can you say with Paul, I want to know Christ. 
I want to know Christ. I want my family to know Christ. I want to know the power of the resurrection, fellowship, sharing in the sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to obtain to the resurrection from the dead. Can you guys see it? Can you see that heaven's coming? And it's coming really quickly. And the choices we make now are going to determine the reward level we're going to have in heaven. Live for Jesus now. Last two verses. Will you be like Paul, who said at the end of his life, I fought the good fight, I finished a race, I've kept the faith. Is your path leading you that way? Verse 15, all of us who are mature should say, take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. The only thing I'd say about that in maturity is the more mature I get, the more I see how sinful I am. And uh, I'll be very frank with you guys. I'm 49 years old. I've lived with myself for 49 years, and I'm really sick of Wayne. <laughs> I really am. But Jesus has lived in me for 20 years. I haven't got tired of him at all. He's more beautiful than I can comprehend. So no, I have no apology for saying I want to know Christ. And it's going to cost me some stuff. I'm going to make some choices that are going to, I'm going to lose on some things. But I want to know Christ because I have this holy dissatisfaction that I want to get to know this God who would actually go on a seek and rescue mission to find a drunk, drug abusing, womanizing, gambling, foul mouthed man like me and say, you're coming with me, Wayne. I want to know that God. Do you? It's going to cost you. Last verse. Only let us live up to what we've already obtained. Keep going. Brothers and sisters, I trust the majority of you. It's just an encouragement. Keep going. Keep pursuing him wholeheartedly. He's worth it. It's going to be worth it when we get there. Will you pray with me? Father, I want to pray for uh, some of my older brothers and sisters here. Oh, Lord, don't let them stop. Don't let them slow down. Let them run the race marked out for them with perseverance, Lord. I pray for myself and I pray for uh, a lot of my friends here, Lord. Let them break that tape strong, Lord. Don't let them limp across the finish line with poor choices, Lord. Let them fix their eyes on you. Lord, I pray for the young people here today. Oh, Lord, let their life be about one thing. Let it, at an early age, at the dawn of their life, let it be about Jesus Christ and him crucified, Lord. I pray for the young people here today. I pray you'd speak to their hearts and they'd say, Forget all that secondary stuff. Live for my son. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would raise up many young people in this congregation that are singularly focused, not on baseball, not on uh, anything else, but on knowing Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for someone here that maybe is still sitting with that get-out-of-jail-free card in their hip pocket. Lord, let them tear up that card. Let them run into your arms. Lord, let them be serious about you. Let them not play the game anymore. Save their soul today. Lord, I pray for some here who need to forget the past. Lord, the people here that are proud, saying, oh man, you should have seen how we had it going on in 04. Lord, forget 04. It's today. Lord, I pray that uh, you would convict someone that maybe is living in the past from a painful circumstance. Maybe there's some shame involved, some guilt. Lord, I pray that they would run to the cross and find relief for their guilt. And Lord, they would be able to praise your holy name. And uh, Lord, for the rest of us who are running the race marked out before us, I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters, that they would uh, continue to count the cost and worship you because you've been good and faithful and loving towards them this whole journey. I love you, Lord, and I just pray you bless my friends in Jesus' name. Amen.